we take a deep dive into Shepperton's sewers. We show how director Gordon Fleming battled to liven up the film with last minute pickup shots, and we reveal why a turquoise door was the most exciting image we ever found on the internet. Make sure you subscribe to get notified when our incredible episode 5 drops next week. After completion of most of the material on the Shepperton backlot, preparations were underway back in Studio H for the scene in which Dortmund sacrifices himself. With filming complete on the Dalek spaceship from earlier in the movie, the flying saucer components of the set were removed, leaving a vast vacant space of ruined buildings. Two of these structures right at the back of the studio will become significant, a stepped factory frontage with mullion windows, and hiding in the shadows alongside it, a destroyed building we'll refer to as a bungalow. Panning to the right, there are several shops, including this one with V-shaped damage to its brickwork. Past the side street is a shop, unfortunately named Mary Bell, a name which would become famous two years after the film due to a notorious double murderer. By macabre coincidence, it was in front of this shop that stuntman Eddie Powell fell and broke his ankle before his character was killed. At the end of the row is the alleyway from which David emerged at the start of the film and was confronted by a Dalek and next to it is where the phalanx of seven Daleks lined up, in front of a house with a distinctive fanlight window. The original footage of the phalanx was taken from a high angle and filmed in long shot. It was an unsatisfying view of the aliens, and once they fired their weapons, they were obscured from view. With the set now being prepared for Dortmund's death scene, director Gordon Fleming took the opportunity to shoot some new footage of the monsters. This time the angle would be lower and closer to make the Daleks more menacing. The evidence for this being done later is the scaffolding here, where the house with the fanlight has been dismantled and another is being erected in its place. More proof of the timeline is in the Daleks themselves, which have sustained damage during the intervening location work, such as this dent on the skirt of Dalek 6 caused by the van striking it. This row of shops behind the Daleks was left intact, but meanwhile the section which had held the flying saucer was ready for redevelopment into the TARDIS landing site. The shop with the V-shaped damage and its neighbour were left standing, whilst a new bombed out building was constructed, featuring an arched passageway. At the back of the studio, visible in this shot, the stepped factory frontage with mullion windows is still in place where it had been standing behind the Dalek spaceship. Set dressing included conspicuous sugar puffs posters placed in return for sponsorship money. The large cyclorama at the back of the studio featured a painted backdrop of London landmarks, plus some very odd artistic choices. The structure with the green dome does not match any known place in the capital, so it must be constructed between now and 2150 AD. Despite the white columns visible in another angle, it is not an attempt to depict St Paul's Cathedral as you might assume. You can be certain of this because the real St Paul's Cathedral is visible on the far left. But this merely raises more questions, as it appears as a mirror image of how St Paul's would look if viewed from near Embankment Station, where we know our heroes had landed. But that's not the only geographical problem. This is meant to be the post office tower, although it looks quite different by 2150 AD. However, you would need to turn 90 degrees to the north in order to see it. This location becomes even more confusing when Doctor Who sees the flying saucer and says, Well, it appears to be landing in the vicinity of Sloan Square. However, the ship is flying towards St Paul's Cathedral, which is in the opposite direction to Sloan Square. But it becomes clear that the River Thames is behind the camera, meaning Post Office Tower and Sloan Square are situated correctly, and it seems we were never supposed to notice St Paul's Cathedral in the corner of the backdrop. The only way to rationalise the discrepancy is to assume that by 2150 AD, St Paul's is moved to the west of London. Or alternatively, the weird backdrop, period architecture and old-fashioned cars can all be explained if this entire segment of the adventure takes place in a 1950s theme park. These aesthetic issues were addressed in other versions of the script. In Terry Nation's original draft for the television serial, a calendar gives the year as 2041. The Doctor then observes that although they are in the 21st century, London looks like it did in the 1960s, so he reasons that whatever catastrophe overcame the city happened in the 1970s. It was script editor David Whittaker who decided to set the story 200 years in the future at the time of broadcast, i.e. 2164. But in Milton Sobotsky's original draft for the movie, the events were only 50 years in the future, Daleks Invasion Earth 2016 AD. 
The high shot of debris landing on the TARDIS was taken using a camera position above the Mary Bell shop on the spot where Eddie Powell fell. This is evidenced by the joists projecting out of the bottom of the shot here and these can be seen during the stunt sequence here. Before we leave the TARDIS landing site on stage H, the high angle showing St Paul's revealed another point of interest. The stepped factory frontage with the mullion windows is about to be taken from its indoor location and we discover it's put to inventive use outdoors. In order to film scenes which were supposed to be set on the deserted streets of London, a costly location shoot was avoided by the resourcefulness of the production team. A night shoot was arranged instead amongst Shepperton's own studio buildings, beginning here between the props building and the store's painters and plasterers. The area was dressed with polystyrene rubble, timber and scrap cars, such as this E-Series Vauxhall Saloon, which was already over ten years old at the time and approaching two centuries old when the story was set. The cameras were then turned 180 degrees to face the boiler house situated next to the reservoir. However, had these buildings been seen in their contemporary form, they did not make for a convincing street in the centre of post-apocalyptic London. To solve this problem, the crew took two pieces of scenery outside. From the recently dismantled TARDIS landing site, the factory with the mullion windows, which had appeared here behind the flying saucer, and they also took the destroyed bungalow. They were transported the short distance across the Shepperton compound and re-erected in the opposite order, with the factory on the right and the bungalow on the left. The same four Daleks were used at the opposite end of the street and the camera position was changed slightly for the shot of them attempting to exterminate our heroes in the sewers. Another old car can be seen as set dressing as Doctor Who and David escape down the access hole. After making it out of London, the pair encountered two robo-men on a log bridge, which is to the southwest of the mine, situated here, and formerly the location of the African village seen in Sanders of the River. And a little to the north is the location of a stone cave where they encounter Philip Maddox's character, and once again the large green embankment of the reservoir is clearly visible in the background. The final site used on the Shepperton backlot was another of the working studio buildings. This distinctive pair of arched garages, which can also be seen in this aerial view, are used as the location where Susan, Wyler and Dortmund steal the van, and this shot shows the engineer's workshop across the yard. The real buildings were augmented with fake fuel pumps and signage, and this is a false wall in order to obscure some of the studio buildings behind. You can still glimpse the distinctive reservoir embankment, which again undermines the idea of this being central London. The same garages can be seen in these photos, taken the previous year after the first Dalek movie, as the props were being prepared for a road journey of over 800 miles in order to appear at the Cannes Film Festival, but that's another story. We return to stage H for the shooting of the final sequences. A small set had been constructed for the bridge of the flying saucer for one brief scene. The red Dalek enters through a door with three lights above it. As Doctor Who, Wyler and Susan are led into the bomb control room, you can see that the doorway in the background has been repurposed from the saucer bridge and you can just make out the holes above the door where the bulbs have been removed. Following its brief appearance on the saucer, the Gold Dalek then took centre stage at the bomb control area. This was an impressive two-storey set built off the ground to give depth below floor level with a pulley built onto a girder in the ceiling for the transportation of the Dalek's bomb. There are other recycled components on this set which have a longer and more interesting history. The Trading Post was a company which had been making and hiring out props since 1938 but became more active as the film industry grew in the 1950s and 60s. They were based here at 17 Whitley Gardens in Southall, from where they supplied props for productions at Pinewood and Shepperton as well as the BBC and many others. Although not credited on the Doctor Who TV series until several years later when they took on more visual effects design, they were contributing since its very first episode, having provided set dressing for the original TARDIS interior. Ray Cusick is known to have used their stock for The Rescue, seen here. Amongst their vast array of electronics was a collection of rack-mounted panels. This unit appeared unchanged in the Space Museum. Also hired for the rescue was this block of dials, which can be seen in other productions such as the Sensorites earlier in 1964 and other units from the same group such as this one, seen later in the Tenth Planet. The racks appear frequently in Doctor Who and in other productions such as the Avengers. 
Here in the episode Death at Bargain Prices, there's a specific unit with rows of 1, 4 and 5 dials. And also take note of the rack with 3 small dials which form a triangle. One of the Trading Post's best customers was the ABC series Out of the Unknown, and this clip shows the robotizing desk. Around September 1965, a set of big panels was added to their inventory, which were more aesthetically pleasing than the racks. This set of 18 possibly made their first appearances in Out of the Unknown, in stories such as The Counterfeit Man, which also featured the robotizing control panel, Time in Advance, and 13 to Centaurus. But they proved popular, and at least 12 of them were used in the Daleks' master plan, recorded in November. In mid-January, six of the big panels were hired for the Avengers, along with the robotizing desk and the older rack-mounted units. Eight of them were hired for Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. As mentioned in our previous episode, they were initially used to dress the saucer, but then came to be used on the top story of the bomb control room. This level also used several of the racks pointed out in the Avengers, with the rows of one, four and five dials, and next to it the panel with the triangular layout. Also in this shot is a small cabinet, which is part of the equipment used in The Seeds of Death, one of the few Doctor Who stories on which the Trading Post were credited. Soon after the Daleks film finished production, a BBC props master called Bill King left the corporation to join the Trading Post and head their expansion into visual effects. King used his old BBC contact, Jack Kine, to secure work, and as a result, the Patrick Troughton era saw even more work for the Trading Post. Thereafter, those distinctive big panels would be seen frequently in Doctor Who, notably even making up part of the TARDIS set on several occasions. Due to their work on the invasion, building props such as the Cyber Coordinator, the Trading Post are often wrongly attributed as the builders of the 1960s Cybermen too. Bill King never had any involvement with the Cybermen, and the moon base wheel and invasion helmets and chest units were fabricated by John and Jack Lovell but the Trading Post did supply the cyber ships for the model work in the invasion, and they reused one of these as set dressing in the following story they worked on, the Crotons. Another cyber ship was hired as set dressing for Spearhead from Space, and this story also included one of the large dome-shaped electronics devices which had cropped up many times before. Perhaps their most distinctive pieces of hardware were two unusual timers, which counted down 50 seconds. Their earliest appearance seems to be in the Sidney Newman-created space adventure series Target Luna. The adventure featured a young Michael Craze who would later play Ben in Doctor Who. They also appeared in the second season, where the show bore the name Pathfinders in Space. And they were initially in the same place in episode 1. The clock on the left can be seen throughout the rest of the serial inside the rocket ships. It crops up again in Carry On Spying, which was filmed in the spring of 1964, and makes an appearance in the TV series of Doctor Who on the set of The War Machines in June 1966, now with its frame removed. The clock on the right appeared in the film The Mindbenders, made in September 1962, and a careful look shows this prop has a distinguishing feature. The number 2 on its dial is lower than the adjacent digits. A couple of months later, it was refurbished with a full clock face for recording of the Avengers episode Traitor in Zebra for which it had a longer and more ornate hand fitted. At the end of 1964, it was used for filming Curse of the Fly, where its clock face had been removed again and the ornate hand had been shortened accordingly. The views in this film clearly show the misaligned number 2, and the four lights on the front are labelled Minutes. Then it made its way into Dalek's Invasion Earth, where the original labels were blanked out, and the Dalek's unit of time Rails was added. The misaligned number is clear to see. A year after this, it would be used in the Underwater Menace, where it still had its RELS label showing. And this prop bears the hallmark of TTP, confirming the trading post as the prop house from which it originated. It appears that work on this set got off to a bad start, with director Gordon Fleming opting to shoot some material concerning the bomb, even before it was ready. The gold Dalek looks off-camera when discussing the explosive device, but if it had been installed, it would have been visible here behind the girder. Once it was fitted, recording could continue freely. Some shots were done with Dalek number 6 on the top floor, and after a break in filming, more scenes were completed with Dalek number 6 on the lower level. Its unusual silver sucker allowing it to be easily identified as it jumps between floors once the film is cut together. 
Similarly, Dalek number 11 also doubled up in more than one place. It appears here on the right, with its distinguishing feature being a spray of silver paint covering the black neck mesh. It alternates between the top and bottom levels in different shots, and is this Dalek situated here at the back. You can find out more about the life story of this prop in our episode 2, discussing Terry Nation's special Daleks. The big set-piece moment at the end of the film was the Roboman Rebellion, which featured two main stunts. The first of which resulted in the Black Dalek's claw being wrenched off by stuntman Joe Powell, brother of Eddie, who earlier broke his ankle. The prop was repaired, resulting in a continuity error. By the end of the fight, many Robomen lay dead around the room, including two obstructing the control panel. A halt was then called, and the effects team rigged the control panel with small pyrotechnics to produce sparks and flames. Only some of the Robomen extras resumed their positions, and lay in slightly different places ready for the first take. The cameras rolled and the effects were triggered, as seen in this photo, but unfortunately the take could not be used. In order to go again, the entire panel had to be cleaned up and repainted to return it to its previous appearance, and in doing so small changes crept in, for example this yellow grill being resprayed silver. With everything reset, the pyrotechnics were set off again, and the second take was a success, so the version with the silver grill is what appears in the film. Another slight continuity error occurs between the different versions, as the Roboman lying on the left of the Dalek is further inside the doorway in the second take. The next phase was for the panel to be completely destroyed, so whilst the crew prepared that effect, the opportunity was taken to shoot the demise of two of the leader Daleks. Rather than damage the real black Dalek, prop number 15 was repainted to act as a stunt double. However, the original red Dalek was sent to its doom, with a board covering the hole needed for when they had a human operator inside. The remainder of the Robomen were removed from the set and the big explosive charge was set off. Because the shoot was nearing its conclusion, there was less emphasis on ensuring the Daleks weren't damaged. Dortmund's death scene was another set piece that had been put off until towards the end of production. Referring back to when these extra shots of the Dalek phalanx were picked up, construction was being carried out to the right of picture. This earlier shot of the set reveals that the scaffolding was a result of the crew building the new Watford Arms pub in front of the old house, and the new structure was in order to hold the practical effects material for the building's collapse. The character of Dortmund then faced off against the Daleks on the same spot that David had been confronted earlier, but before the effect was triggered, actor Godfrey Quigley was replaced by this dummy. The debris was released on the empty props below, as simulated here. However, this first attempt, with prop number 11 on the left, was deemed unusable, so the entire scene had to be reset. This resulted in a change to the Daleks' prop positions, the camera angle, and the layout of the debris. The second take, which makes it to screen, now has Dalek 11 on the opposite end of the row. But before shooting on stage H wrapped entirely, some last-minute additions were made. Seemingly still aware that the first half of the film was heavy on dishevelled humans and not enough shiny Daleks, it was decided that a tiny corner of London Street would be set up to shoot some more material. Once Dortmund's sacrifice had been completed, the street set was no longer required, and therefore dismantled. However, these two first-story frontages, above the Mary Bell shop and its neighbour, were held back in studio to hastily construct a small set. The left and right sides were swapped over, and several feet of fake brickwork was added to raise the height of the windows. Multiple takes were then done of the same two props coming round the corner, two of which were shot in darkness, and also a series of pyrotechnics were set off which could be edited into the battle scene, and these additions concluded all the work on Stage Age at Shepperton. It wasn't until the very end of production that the crew finally left the studio's premises, but initially they only travelled a short distance to the Newfield Bendy Toys factory on the other side of the reservoir. Here they found a suitable warehouse environment for the Doctor and Tom to explore, at a time when the factory wasn't in full production, making their particular brand of rubbery playthings. The company logo can be seen on the boxes, and one is conspicuously open, showing off a range of their products. Location work concluded on the production with this famous shot of the Dalek emerging from the water. During the excursion, footage was also taken of this derelict site. Its whereabouts were never documented at the time, and its location has been unknown for over 50 years. Could we crack this mystery? We knew that the area chosen for the Dalek emerging from the water was near St Mary's Church in Battersea, seen here on this 1940s aerial photo. 
This image shows St Mary's Church on the left, and the causeway down to the River Thames, including the posts which are visible in the movie. This photograph of St Mary's Church in the causeway allows us to better visualise how the Dalek was filmed. Tracks were set up at low tide and the Dalek was pulled along by a cable attached to a vehicle on the road, with two divers in the water to help retrieve the submerged equipment. This comparison shows the difference in lighting between two of the takes used in the final cut. Due to the amount of debris washed up when the tide came in and the shallow slope down to the water, a special wooden platform had to be built on which the actors could stand in order to get the necessary shot which included the Dalek. A little further along the river bank, a plate shot was set up, pointing towards a similar area of the opposite bank, but at a slightly higher angle. And then another matte painting was created in order to show Lot's Road power station in a destroyed state. The fact that the matte painting view is higher suggests that the film was taken from street level, not down on the shore. The carefully painted smashed windows of the power station here are also visible in their true state when the Dalek emerges from the Thames, unfortunately creating discontinuity with the matte painting. Plus a barge is present behind the Dalek, but not in the plate shot. This is what Lots Road power station looks like today, and if we pan to the right, we can see a jetty covering a channel cut into the river. This can just be glimpsed at the very top of frame in this shot. This illustrates that Jill Curzon was filmed a few yards downriver, probably just in front of the church here, with the channel on the far bank visible here. It was likely to have been up here that the camera was positioned for the matte painting shot, taking in the view of the power station, which is also visible behind the Dalek. This photograph from the opposite bank allowed us to crack the 50-year-old mystery and work out exactly where that extra footage was shot of the Daleks in front of the derelict buildings. The frontage seen in the movie has a distinctive turquoise coloured door with a lattice window alongside it, and careful examination of this photo revealed, in the background, a distinctive turquoise coloured door and latticed window. We had finally managed to locate the damaged factory where the unknown shot had been taken. And by analysing the relative positions of the adjacent buildings in this aerial photograph, we can place the position of the extra location work exactly here. The buildings have long since been demolished and redeveloped into Somerset Nursery School, but you can still stand on the causeway where the Dalek came ashore. So what happened to Shepperton Studios following the Dalek's departure? Stage H, pictured here along with the rest of the site, was soon in use again. The new street, seen here in Oliver in 1968, was erected where the Dalek's mine had been filled in. The film's star, Ron Moody, would later recall that the props from the Doctor Who production lay scattered around as they filmed Oliver, as seen in this photo. We kept passing these battered Daleks. They were all falling apart in the rain and the weather. Rather a sad sight in a way. In the 1970s, the whole mine area was sold off for housing development. The standing set of the original street did not see much further use, although it did appear briefly in the 1967 version of Casino Royale. One location that you can still visit today is accessed via these gates, leading to a public footpath, which is the route that the van drove down. And you can even stop on the exact spot where it was blown up. Although the boathouses have been demolished, the site of the pond can still be located, because the statues have never been removed. The TV version of Doctor Who visited Shepperton twice in the following decades, making use of stages A and K. This pyrotechnic model work for the season 16 story The Pirate Planet was filmed on stage K in 1978 and was the first time the BBC production had ever used these studios. Doctor Who returned to Shepperton for the final time in June 1983 for filming that was originally planned to take place at Ealing Television Film Studios. The BBC schedule was thrown into chaos when the government called a snap election, and these scenes featuring the Silurians underwater base were shot on stage A over a two-day period. Following its use in Dalek's Invasion Earth in 1966, Stage H became the moon's surface for the seminal science fiction film 2001. The set was erected with a raised ground level so that the scene could show the excavation down below the surface to reveal the buried monolith. The gigantic studio space has been used many times in subsequent years whenever a production needed a huge set. Examples include the Rebel base in Star Wars and the Batcave in the Christopher Nolan movie Batman Begins. A more recent film which exploited the scale of Stage H was the second Thor movie in which Odin's throne room was built, 
and Joss Whedon returned here in 2015 for Avengers Age of Ultron. But there has probably never been another film shot like Dalek's Invasion Earth, where a dozen varied locations were found within one square mile, resulting in this shrewd and cost-effective method of filmmaking which created an invaluable time capsule record of 1966 Shepperton Studios.